thank you, Dr. Ernat, for being with us today and sharing your expertise. And I will give the stage to you. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and for having me. I think it's uh, so cool to connect with you all on a global scale. And, uh, you know, maybe the pandemic has some small blessings in it, and it's stuff like this where we can connect and actually see each other more than just email and phone call. Um, so I, I, a little bit about myself. So I, I work at a university setting here in the States, and um, my focus is sports medicine as it pertains to knee and shoulder surgery, probably more so knee than shoulder. Um, and so along that regard, I have a very vested interest in the ACL and you know, expanding its techniques and applications and always trying to get better and get smarter. And, um, you know, I've been working with uh, MyTech and J&J &J and, you know, the, the quad tendon reconstruction was one of the, I guess, gaps in the portfolio. And over the course of the last year have found kind of techniques and uh, really uh, experimented and perfected how to bridge those gaps. And so that's, you know, uh, probably the majority of what we'll talk about today, but also happy to entertain any other questions about ACL surgery and, and stuff like that. I know a lot of times um, across different countries, let alone different continents, uh, there's different availability of techniques and to equipment and stuff. And so um, we've really thought about this from every angle. And so if, if you have a, a problem with the equipment or accessibility, we've thought about it. So please fire away with questions. I think this is a, a nice summary and it basically focuses more on the harvest and graft preparation technique um, and, and you know less on actual reconstruction, but there are some nuances to the reconstruction. So um, like Chris said, fire away with questions or you know after or whatever, this is only about a five or six minute presentation. So um, you know, all the usual disclaimers. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, why, why use quad tendon? Um, you know, the data we have to date says if at minimum it's comparably effective to all the other autographs we have, if nothing else, it just offers the surgeon another autograft option. Um, and I know in some places access to like allograft is not readily available. So um, particularly in uh, patients with other traumas or in revision settings, always having more options is uh, favorable. I like it as a soft tissue graft as opposed to the hamstring more and more because when we harvest hamstrings, we're kind of limited by the patient morphology versus when we harvest a quad, similar to when you're harvesting a patellar li ligament or a patellar tendon, um, you can actually, it, you can harvest the size that you want. You don't have to rely on their morphology. And as you'll see here, um, the ease of, of harvesting this, it's very straightforward. It's really cosmetically friendly. There's absolutely no special equipment needed for the harvest. And really the only equipment that's special that you need is whatever you would use to implant the uh, graft. So um, where am I using it currently? Like I said, a lot in revision settings, I keep it in consideration. Um, if I have a recreational athlete that's under the age of 40 um, and above the age of 25 or 30, I think it's a good option. Um, I've gone further and further away from using hamstrings, particularly in female athletes um, where they might not be indicated for a patellar tendon or a, or a patellar ligament. The reason for this is females tend to be a little bit more valgus or kind of knock-kneed while males are more bow-legged. And so if I'm harvesting a structure on the medial side of the knee, am I, am I exacerbating this? Additionally, the quad to hamstring muscle strength um, imbalance in females. Uh, quads are more dominant than hamstrings in females. So now if I'm taking away uh, potential muscle function, am I furthering this imbalance? So that's really kind of driven me in that regard. People over the age of 40 or 50 that are 
really active or have an aversion to using allograft, I think this is a great option. And then lastly, more young patients that um, need a soft tissue. Again, I can dial in the size of this. I don't have to worry about the size of their hamstrings. And maybe their, uh, their growth plates are not fully closed, so a VTB would not be a good option. The people that I'm still not quite uh, buying in on are what I would use a VTB for, and that's the high-level athlete that is skeletally mature, um, but under the age of 25. Um, so I think that there is good evidence to suggest that BTB is probably still the best for that. But I know I have a lot of colleagues that are actively studying and challenging if the quad has a role in those patients. This is kind of what my back table looks like uh, for this procedure. It's pretty simple, as you can see. Um, there's some specific uh, MyTech equipment like the cruciate guides, the twister reamer, the um, BTB rigid loop adjustable implants, um, the speed traps are optional, um, but the rest of it is just very simple. There's a set of scissors, a knife, um, you know, and an elevator of some sort, and that's pretty much about it. So there's some videos here and we'll talk through. This is specifically the harvest. Um, this is a combination of a actual patient and then a, a cadaver specimen. You can see that the incision really is not that big. Um, it's right off the border of the vastus medialis muscle belly at the superior pole of the patella. And I open the skin, there's a little bit of fat you can excise. And then I just elevate the rest of that fat off the quad tendon in all directions so that I can get a retractor underneath there and get good visualization. This elevation is really critical because it, it uh, allows for better visualization, but it also improves uh, cosmesis by being able to use a smaller incision. I, with that being said, when I was first learning and figuring this out, my incision was probably twice this size and I would not hesitate to do that until you kind of get the hang of the anatomy and, um, and, and what you need to do to get this graft out. So after I've got that all elevated, I'll actually stick my arthroscopy camera up through the wound to identify the trajectory of the quad as well as make sure I've gotten it appropriately elevated. I'm also making sure I'm not violating any of the quad muscle belly. Um, and what I'll do is I'll stick it all the way up. And as you can see on the right there, I actually tent the skin with the camera so I can see the light and I mark the proximal most extent of the quad tendon. And then I'll pinch the camera at the superior pole and pull it out. And now I can kind of get an idea of the length of my quad tendon uh, with a ruler uh, because you're going to want at least about 65 to 70 millimeters of tendon uh, to get an adequate reconstruction. And I have yet to encounter a patient that hasn't been able to provide that much tendon. Uh, so next, I kind of mark where the tendon inserts on the uh, pole of the patella. The quad's nice and versatile because you can use an all soft tissue graft, or you can actually take a little bone plug of the patella as well. So if you have surgeons that like bone to bone fixation, they have that option. If you like surgeon, have surgeons that like just all soft tissue, it's an option as well. And so I mark that out. I usually shoot for a size nine graft. Um, the quad tendon, uh, when you harvest it can be either full thickness or partial thickness. There's no difference really in that as long as you're getting the width correct uh, with regards to failure rates or outcomes. I try to do a near full thickness. As you'll see on the right there, I'm using the Mayo scissor. I'm looking at the bottom, trying not to violate the joint capsule. And um, what I do is I initially uh, on the left, those two dots, which are nine millimeters, I incise that right off the uh, bony aspect of the patella and then I pass this whip stitch and I, I release part of the tendon just to kind of get it started, keeping it nine millimeters in width. Now, uh, this part is kind of optional. You can either just um, harvest the graft and take it to the back table and prep it. Uh, a couple other things that I've tried before is while it's still in the knee, I use one of the speed trap devices to get more control of the graft. If you've used this device before, you know that usually we pull the tissue all the way through the end. But as you'll see here, I'm actually just pulling the stitches through the end. 
What that does is it allows the speed trap to grasp the tissue, but it also cinches the end of the tissue. So it's kind of more bulletized rather than there's tissue stump sticking outside the stitches. So this just is later going to help with graft passage. Um, if this is too expensive or you don't have access or anything like that, then simple locking stitches you'll see on the right is perfectly acceptable. Um, Mytex also coming out with a, uh, a looped stitch that uh, will generate a locking stitch that uh, um, we'll, I've, I've used before. Anything that's just going to get secure hold in a locking fashion of the end of the graft is appropriate. And so once we got more control, then it's just continued kind of releasing of the tissue. Again, making sure not to violate the muscle belly. Um, and I'm going on the medial side, the lateral side, the undersurface, and just keeping keeping sure that I, I don't uh, thin out the graft or cut it short or divergent to muscle belly. Once I feel like I have enough length, as you'll see in the video on the right, um, the camera can go back in and make sure we're kind of at our our terminal spot. Um, you can also just elevate, lift the skin and directly look up the knee. And once I'm satisfied with that, I make a little percutaneous, percutaneous stab incision uh, right at the most proximal extent, as you'll see. And um, with either visualization with the camera or with um, or with just direct visualization using elevators, I'll release the graft from its proximal extent. That little transverse stab incision is really cosmetic. Sometimes it doesn't even need a stitch. And usually by the first post-op visit at about 10 days, uh, it's very hard to find. Like you can't even see it anymore. So it's very cosmetic, but also doesn't require any special uh, equipment or anything like that. So this is just kind of uh, another view of, of that technique. And... Now we have the graft on the back table. And so um, this is applying the BTB uh, rigid loop adjustable system, uh, which is you know required because unlike um, hamstrings, there's no loop of the soft tissue. It's just a continuous soft tissue. So um, we're getting both ends on the left there prepped with another speed trap, securing it on the graft board. And then in the middle and right uh, using the uh, BTB rigid loop device to shuttle a stitch through the tissue and then up through the uh, mechanism of the um, the implant. Um, I don't know if I can get this to replay. Let's see. There we go. Um, the key to doing this, and it's in the technique guide as well as those locking stitches that you've already placed. So if you'll see in the middle, the uh, suture from the implant is going behind the locking stitch in a staggered fashion. And what that does is the locking stitch prevents that rigid loop suture from ripping through the graft as you go to tension it. So um, uh, that's really critical. It uh, has several uh, beneficial factors biomechanically as well. It allows the graft to be completely dunked into the tunnel. Um, and uh, tensioned as far in as it can go, but also adds strength to the construct. The other thing about this is the quad is uh, tendon is in layers. Um, so you have to make sure that you're passing through all layers of the quad tendon, which would be like superficial to deep, not medial to lateral. Uh, again, this is kind of reiterated in the technique guide, but that's gonna provide the most biomechanical strength of this construct. Um, and uh, prevent these stitches from ripping out. Uh, you can use any sort of needle you want. I usually use a curved needle. You can use a, a straight needle. You can use a spinal needle with a wire passer. But this is also just another kind of close-up view of you can see the locking stitches in place. I'm passing the stitch behind the locking stitches. That's going to add strength, uh, biomechanical pull-out strength. Here's some pictures of final constructs. Um, so you can see the stitches have been passed through, um, not the end of the graft, but about a centimeter or so into the graft. Um, we have a suspensory fixation on both sides. And um, I usually put my graft on tension afterwards. Um, 
I leave the stitches like from the speed trap in the end, as you can see in the bottom picture, the green stitches coming out. Because what this does is when you are pulling this graft into the knee, if you were just to pull on the rigid loop stitches, the tip of the graft would probably get bunched up and maybe never engage the tunnel. So what I do is I, I get the graft up near the tunnel and then I pull on the green stitches to bring the graft into the tunnel and, and bottom it out. And then I use the white rigid loop stitches to secure the tension of the implant. Here's another uh, schematic using the uh, continuous loop suture, the perma loop suture from MyTech. Um, and you can just see again, the, the rigid loop uh, suspensory sutures are staggered behind the locking suture. The rest then is just however you like to do your ACL reconstruction. Uh, on this guide, it's an all inside, so using the twister. Um, but I also will commonly use um, just a regular uh, reamer on the tibia and completely drill out the tibia. Um, the nice thing about the quad and this entire uh, setup is, like I said, you can use a bone plug, you can use soft tissue. You can do suspensory fixation. You can just do interference fixation. It's a really dynamic, uh, adjustable um, kind of technique that's conducive to all ACL reconstruction techniques. And on the femoral side, here's my cruciate plus, uh, also kind of getting prepared to drill my femoral tunnel. Uh, and I use the twister reamer there as well. This is my uh, trainee, my resident, who's doing it in the lab um, uh, and drilling in that femoral tunnel and uh, passing the, the stitches. Um, again, pretty pretty straightforward, but also uh, you can use an anteromedial portal or even a transtibial technique if that's what your surgeon is using. Once we have the tunnels drilled, then I, I shuttle the graft in. If you are gonna use an all inside technique, I like to dock the tibial side first. Um, and when I drill my tibial tunnel, I actually over drill it. Um, there's a little bit of math that goes into this. So um, again, we're shooting usually for a 65 to 70 uh, millimeter graft. The intra articular length of the ACL is about 25 to 30 millimeters. So, Let's presume we have a 65 millimeter graft. Uh, 30 millimeters of the graft is going to be in the joint. So we're left with about 35 millimeters for tunnel drilling. So I usually will drill my femoral tunnel to about 15 to 20 millimeters. Um, and uh, I leave that short on purpose. And then I over drill the tibial tunnel um, to about 30 millimeters. This gives me about 10 millimeters of wiggle room so that my graft doesn't get bottomed out in the tunnels. So I pull the tibial uh, sutures and pull the graft all the way down into the bottom of the tibial tunnel. And um, that gives me easier passage of the graft into the femoral tunnel. And then I'm going to bottom out the graft in my femoral tunnel and flip the button and tension the femoral uh, implant. And I think this video is doing that here. And now that the femoral side of the graft is in, I know I can get my guaranteed 15 to 20 millimeters of graft in the femoral tunnel and it's tensioned and secured. And so then I should get an equivalent 15 to 20 millimeters in the tibial tunnel and I tension that next. And it's almost foolproof if you do that little bit of math that you're not gonna bottom out your graft, you're not gonna leave your graft short and you're gonna have an appropriate amount of graft in both the femoral and tibial tunnels. Um, and so then here, I think here we are just uh, finishing the tensioning on both sides um, to complete the fixation. And there's a look at the completed reconstruction in the knee. You can see this, this patient on the right, um, this is his first post-op visit. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that's the little stab incision up there at only 10 days after surgery. And here's 10 days after the harvest. So really very cosmetically friendly to the patient. 
So I think this is a nice, efficient method to do quadriceps ACL reconstruction. I think, you know, I'll be 100% honest. I don't use the all inside every time. If it really depends on the level of training I have. I have anywhere from first year orthopedic surgical trainees all the way through people that have been in training for six years. So uh, with the younger trainees, I tend to be more simple and not do the all inside versus with the older trainees trying to kind of uh, diversify their surgical portfolio. We, we usually get a little bit more technical, but this can be readily applied to any technique you want. Thank you, Dr. Ernan. Okay, people, now it's a perfect time for the questions. You better have some or I'll start calling on people. Let's go, Amaya. I mean, this is the afternoon for you. Come on now. <laughs> Leading on that question, you know, Justin, yeah. I, I want to hear, hear you because, you know, in, in the EMEA, we are still using very much uh, hamstrings and, and the VTPs. So, so in your point of view, you have just recently started to use more and more quad tendon. Mm -hmm. What did you use before? Yeah, I was um, hamstring or BTB, and I was um, probably like a straight 50-50 split for like the first three or four years of my practice. Um, I think after that, I started to think more and more about, is it just autographed or allograft? And I started to think about individualizing the patient selection more and more. And then, um, you know, that's where the quad really came into more of the decision making as well. And uh, how I mentioned that there's some of these mechanical factors, like in the female athlete, for example, where maybe the hamstring doesn't make as much sense as far as just overall function or graft selection. And um, so I've started replacing the quad for the hamstring a little bit more and more. Now, don't get me wrong, I still use hamstring. I'm doing one today. Uh, I'm doing a BTB today. Um, so, uh, you know, I still select out these patients. I just think more and more our care is getting individualized and there's less blanket treatment for everybody. And, um, and so, you know, that's how my transition has been. It's not that I am doing more quad just because I like the technique. I'm doing it more because I'm individualizing my treatments and um, and, go, and going along that route. Um, so I think the nice thing about this is the like anybody that's using BTB or hamstring can use these techniques because the it's almost the middle ground. It, it applies ap uh, principles from both of those um, graphs. And um, again, just diversifies the profile for what you can, can offer a patient. Um, so I, I, um, I started out simple. Like I said, I used just regular reamers. I used uh, anterior medial portal drilling, um, you know, and then I, over time, uh, kind of adapted more specific stuff like this all inside to the quad itself. But when I was doing hamstring, I was doing all inside quadrupled hamstring and almost the exact same technique. So it just, it was an easy transition. And I, you know, I, I think from part as it pertains to you, on the representative side, as opposed to on kind of my side as the surgeon side, I think if you have a surgeon that's interested in this, that's probably your strongest selling point is that they already know how to do it. It's just grabbing a different piece of tissue, basically. That's really all it is. And as you saw in the video, the getting that tissue out, it's, it's a pair of scissors, you know, and a knife. It's nothing... <laughs> There's nothing otherwise special about it. You can see the whole dang thing. It's really pretty easy and straightforward. The rehabilitation doesn't change. I actually, funny enough, I just got an MRI of one of my quad ACL patients um, who was having problems with other stuff in their leg. And she's about six months from her, from her quad ACL. And I was really curious to see what it looked like. And 
the quad tendon is completely healed back together. Like it looks completely normal. It's it's actually pretty phenomenal. I've never seen a post up MRI yet in one, and and um, you know her quad strength is is what I would expect for any other graft. So um, it's it was it's really neat to see. I just got it this morning. All right, I'm gonna start calling on people. <laughs> So I thank you, Bart and Olga, for being on camera. I know that some hey, of you Chris. are in cases. Yes. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off too because we, me, and you had talked about how sometimes the twister is not available uh, to everybody, or it's too expensive to justify. Yes. Um, so there's one technical pearl that I glossed over with that um, because on the femoral tunnel. I'm sure people there that don't have a twister are still using suspensory fixation by by drilling it and um, drilling smaller and then flipping the button and all that. That's the easy part. On the tibial side, it's okay. You can still drill a full tunnel. But the one thing that you got to keep in mind is a quad graft at 65 to 70 millimeters is significantly shorter than a patellar tendon or a hamstring graft. And so when you when you pull that up through, there only tends to be about 20 millimeters of graft in the tibial tunnel, and it's all going to be way up in the tunnel, right? Because it's it's inside the joint. So when your surgeon is putting in their interference screw, say for example, on that side, you can still use a, a button. You can use the jumbo button or whatever if they want to. But if you're going to fix the tibial side with an interference screw with a quad, if you just put the screw in until the screw is flush with the tibial tunnel, it's not going to fix the quad. It's going to fix all the sutures coming out because the graft is still way up in there. So what I do in those scenarios, like when I have my junior residents, is while the tibial screw is going up into the tibial tunnel, I actually put my camera into the knee joint and I put the screw all the way up in until I can see the tip of the screw at the aperture of the tibial tunnel in the joint. Then I know my screw has fixed the entire amount of quad tendon that's inside the tibial tunnel. So, um, so you don't need a twister reamer to do any of this. You can use basic nuts and bolts like an interference screw. Alternatively, you can still use the button and you just use the bigger button on the tibial side. I've done that before too. So I, it truly is applicable to every technique that your surgeon would want to use. I've also even, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I've also even taken the and tied it over a, a metal screw and washer on the tibia, super old school. So like you can, you can do anything you want. Hello, everyone. Can I ask a question, please? Please. Yes, thank you for the presentation. And I noted that uh, you mentioned that you all the drill the tibial tunnel by 10 mil to uh, have the possibility to adjust uh, the, uh, to tighten uh, the transplant. Uh, I was wondering if you do that both for both uh, uh, soft tissue grafts and BTB grafts. And is it always 10 mil that you over drill or maybe uh, different techniques for this case. Yeah, so I, I do it for the soft tissue, whether it's like a, an all inside quadriceps or an all inside hamstring. Uh, on my my patellar, my BTB though, I, um, I, I just use interference screws for all my BTBs. So I just am drilling the whole thing, no matter what. So um, that one is a, is a lot more challenging with a BTB because it's a longer graft usually, and there's a lot more uh, math and measurements involved. So, but for my BTBs, I'm using interference screws on both. So I haven't had any experience with that, but definitely if whether it's a hamstring or a quad, and if it's all inside, I'm always over drilling 10 millimeters by doing that quick little math that I talked about. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Doctor, right. question from Italy. If you, yes. I can. Yes, please. I, I I saw that in your first uh, slide you mentioned that you are using uh, uh, this technique for adolescents when they require uh, ACL reconstruction. So I wanted to ask, uh, what are the benefits that you see in using this technique for the adolescent? 
Good question. I don't know that um, as far as function, there's a clinical benefit, but the reasoning is, and it's specifically it's adolescents that haven't finished growing. So their growth plates are still open. Um, in that scenario, um, a patellar tendon by having bone to bone fixation, there's fear that you could um, cause the growth plate to close and cause growth uh, abnormalities. So in general, we defer to soft tissue grafts in those patients. Previously, I was using hamstring tendons in those patients. But again, because um, typically that individual is gonna be smaller in stature, it's really unpredictable how big of a hamstring tendon they have to offer you. And if it's gonna be of adequate size to have a strong enough graft for your reconstruction. So rather than guessing on what their, their size of their hamstring is, I think the quad is a great alternative because no matter how big or small the patient is, when I harvest the quad, I get to pick the size. It's not the size that the patient is giving me. So it's when I need, need to use a soft tissue rather than a, a bone plug. And um, that way I, I get to pick the size, not the patient is giving me their size. So that's the advantage in my mind. I don't think the hamstring is wrong. I just think the quad is more predictable. Thanks very much for the presentation and for the answer. Of course. Bernard, I have a question. <clears throat> sure, where is the presentation first? And secondly, uh, apparently you're using our products with great success, but before you certainly used something else. And uh, may I ask you why you, you switch to our products or what, 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 uh, what bring our products more to you practice uh, uh, compared to the competitive ones? Yes, first you have to tell me where you're calling from because I'm always I, 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 I'm in the EMEA marketing team and I'm calling from Switzerland. From All right. Switzerland. All right. Um, thanks for your question. So you're going to you're going to think I'm really boring with my answer, but <laughs> the, the main reason I switched in 100, and this is 100 percent honesty, is because the people at my tech sports medicine were much nicer and much harder working. And that's the 100% truth. Uh, um, and that's what inspired me first. I joke with my old rep, which I originally switched. And I told him, like, you have the same stuff as all your competitors. It's just different colors. It's just I like hanging out with you better. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but with that being said, um, uh, from a technical standpoint, um, I do... Um, I started by switching more in the shoulder, actually, um, using some of the implants like the Helix Anchor and the uh, Griffin and Griffin Pronot, and then over time adapted into the knee. And I'll tell you probably from the knee side of things, the equipment that really uh, finally sold me was actually the Cruciate Plus guides, because I think that those guides are very rigid they're very uh, predictable. Like when you put that in, it hits the same spot every single time versus some of the competitors, the guides are flimsy and they loosen and then the pins go all different directions. And so the ease of the cruciate plus guide uh, really put me over the edge. When I um, first started and I was operating, it would just be me and one, one surgical technician. I had no assistance else. So just two of us doing all these surgeries. And, and as you probably know, during like a ACL surgery, to just have two people. It's, it's really hard to have just two people. And so the, the predictability and the rigidity of those guides allowed me to be productive uh, with just the two people. And, and I've just stuck with it ever since. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. A question to the team. What are some of the challenges you're having with ACL reconstruction in your market? And then let's voice that and see if Dr. Ernick can help. And also, I know we talked about quad, but, you know, we can really, this is open discussion. If there's other 
things or whatever. I'm I, I love talking about this stuff. Hit me up. Just a question about the uh, rehabilitation. Um, because of my former job as a physical therapist, um, is there a difference in your rehabilitation with uh, bone tendon bone or soft tissue or quad? Uh, I do not do any differences. I um, uh, assuming that it's just an isolated ACL reconstruction. Uh, my typical thing is I have them in kind of a hinged brace for about six weeks. Um, I let them weight bear is tolerated right away. I let them um, range of motion is tolerated right away. And um, and really, I, I lean on my, P, my therapists a lot. I allow them um, to kind of progress the patient along the weight bearing, range of motion, even strength uh, recovery uh, at, as they see fit on an individualized basis, as long as they're not doing kind of like, you know, open chained exercises or or lateral or agility movements, the the gradual kind of strength progress progression uh, happens, you know, as the patient can tolerate. Um, you know, a lot of people worry about the quad specifically because they worry if it's going to affect the, you know, the muscle mass and recovery of the quad. What I think we tend to forget is whether you're using a quad or an allograft or a hamstring or a patellar tendon, everybody's muscles atrophy. And, um, you know, the patellar tendon is kind of our gold standard and it's just a direct continuation of the quad basically. And, and we still tend to rely on that. And um, there's some good evidence that even at long-term follow-up, whether it's whatever graft, the, the muscles just recover, but they remain a little bit uh, smaller than the other side. So um, it's not been my experience whatsoever that the quad impacts that muscle recovery. And so therefore I don't treat it any differently. I just have everybody do the same thing. Um, and so far, so good. Okay. Yeah. And adding a question about the, um, that quad training, uh, how much percentage are for your patients are returning to sport at the same level? Yeah. So I'll I'll be honest, I've probably only been using the quad now for about a year and a half. So far, um, everybody has been returning, you know, to sport, but I, I couldn't quote you numbers on the same level. Anecdotally, I would tell you I have not noticed a difference that uh, than my other graphs. Um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, I have a a Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, individual who's back at one year uh, doing jiu-jitsu. Um, I have, um, you know, we have lots of rock climbers here in Utah. Um, and so far, all, all of those patients have gotten back. Um, I have not used it on any like collegiate athletes or high school athletes, because like I said, I, I still tend to use patellar tendon in those. So most of mine are recreational. Um, I have another handful of of skiers and snowboarders that it's it's you know winter here, so they're gearing up for ski season and feeling very confident about it. So I, I can't quote you specific numbers, but I have not anecdotally noticed any difference. Okay, yeah, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Doctor Ernat, if, if I can ask another question, please. Sure. Uh, you were saying that you prefer using screws if you go BTB. Uh, I was wondering uh, what is uh, the most important criterion for you to choose uh, the screw and which screw do you use and how do you differentiate how you choose the screw you like? Yes, thank you. Um, I use screws instead of like a suspensory fixation. Uh, simply be, and I don't think there's any science behind this, but this is more of my my just uh, justification that when I harvest the bone plugs from my BTB, it's usually kind of triangular or trapezoidal. It's not a cylinder, right? And when I drill the tunnels, it's a cylinder. So for me to stick a, you know, rectangular or trapezoidal piece of bone into a cylinder, I'm not getting complete bone to bone compression and I worry that the joint fluid going up in and out could compromise healing. 
Now that's just my own self-justification because I know plenty of people use suspensory fixation and get it to heal. But to me, that's just my gut feeling. So that's why I use the screw so that I can compress the bone <clears throat> into the tunnel. Um, as far as which screw, it's probably about a 50-50 split of just a um, old school metal interference screw versus the MyTech Milagro screw. Um, if I have any concern that the patient's bone is going to be really, really dense, for example, um, like I have a collegiate football player that is, you know, um, like, well, I know I'm speaking to the wrong lines, but I was going to say six foot three and like 250 pounds. I don't know the conversion, sorry. <laughs> but um, a very large individual with hard bone, I'll trend towards metal. Um, if it's more of a kind of normal body morphology, then I do use the Milagro. Um, and again, no science. That's just my own uh, gut feeling justification. But those are the two implants that I would use. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick question. I need to also give my country. So from Finland, from Nordics. Yes. So uh, you're using quite a much, you know, MyTech products currently. Which is your favorite one and why? And you can okay. include many SKUs, ACL, yeah. PCL, extracapsular, whatever. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm boring again because I still think the Cruciate Plus system is like, is the, the, the best thing that uh, my tech has given us because it's so reliable. It's like my right hand man. Um, but to not be too boring, um, I would say with my knee profile, uh, the rigid loop, um, I've kind of figured out a way to use that, whether it's the standard one or the BTB one, I've started using it more and more. So I'm now in a similar graft prep fashion, as you saw for this one, I'm using it also for collateral ligament reconstructions, PCL reconstructions. And um, I got some really crazy x-rays uh, that I could probably show you at another time where there's uh, you know, a, like a three or four uh, ligament knee reconstruction and there's about eight rigid loop buttons floating in that, in that knee. It's, it's, um, I like that you can tension it and get good solid fixation. Um, in the shoulder, uh, uh, shoulder instability is one of my favorite procedures, and I, I love the Griffin Pro Knot. It's just so easy. It gets you a nice um, reproducible sliding knot that you can tension in a bunch of different ways, and um, it's, it's really efficient uh, for labral repairs. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We got about 10 more minutes before Dr. Ernest jumps into cases. We're appreciative of your time. So any questions? It could be even shoulder or knee or complaints. <laughs> I'd love to hear your complaints. Or if you're selling a multi-bag, which some of you are, why are you not selling more MyTech? I have a third one if, if uh, everyone is silent. Yes. <laughs> I would like to know if uh, you love Cruciate Plus instrumentation, uh, do you use it for PCL reconstruction? And if you do, which technique do you do? Which fixators do you use? Did you say PCL? PCL, yeah. 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 So for I do use it for PCL as well. I use um, the PCL tibial guide that it's not like the true bullseye, but it's got the really smaller pinhole so that the guide pin gets protected uh, and you can still hook the back of the tibia. Um, I use it um, and I will drill out the entire tibial tunnel and fixate the tibial side with a Milagro screw. And then typically I am using an allograft for those reconstructions. Um, and I would use a rigid loop adjustable, and I just use a single bundle 
rigid loop adjustable on the femur side. So I'll use the cruciate plus on the femur side as well um, with a twister reamer. And, and that's how I'll do it. Now, for, for my practice um, and probably for everybody's practice, PCLs are really rare. Um, you know, there's just not a lot that get done. I do more PCLs as part of multi-ligamentous reconstructions um, than just isolated. And so the only um, caveat to that PCL setup is if I am, if there's a, is if there's an also an, an MCL reconstruction getting done, sometimes the PCL and MCL tunnels can converge on the medial femur. And so I definitely use the cruciate plus for that because I have more flexibility on where I want to put that PCL tunnel. But sometimes I will default to just an interference screw with an Achilles tendon bone block on the femoral side if I'm worried about too much drilling and stuff going on the medial femur. Because um, that allows me to fixate the graft from inside the knee rather than having a button on the outside of the knee. So. Um, I try to not get my roads crisscrossing with those more complex cases. Um, but by and large, it's rigid loop, femur, milagro, tibia. Um, if you don't have access to allograft readily, then I, uh, then I would probably use a, a patellar tendon for the PCL for that. And I would consider you, and it's say if there was a associated ACL, then I would use either a hamstring or a quad for my ACL if I had to go all autograft. Um, but, um, yeah. Thank you for this comprehensive uh, answer. And uh, that's interesting that you mentioned uh, that the twister is useful here because we get these questions. Why do we have used twister? Maybe we can go with an ordinary reamer because yeah. our bill side you fixed with screw. So it uh, does not make any sense. No, it makes sense. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Ski resorts and the Australian ski resorts. The quadricep tendon seems to be adequate alternative for the near future. What are your thoughts, Dr. Ernit, about uh, skiing injuries? Yeah, skiers are tough because if you tell a skier, you know, that they need a uh, ACL surgery and then um, most skiers are, at least here in the States, are averse to patellar tendons because they worry about chronic patellar tendonitis. And so then they, there's this stigma here that a skier is better suited for a hamstring. Um, but in my, my mind, I would say, well, you know, you're in this crouched position all the time and you're firing both your quad and your hamstring. So there's no right answer because the, then you're going to be hamstring, you know, potentially hamstring strength deficient as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of dogma that exists. Again, it's been uh, my experience that a quad graft has no impact on their um, recovery or function and strength level. Uh, we're going to start actually um, objectively measuring their side to side strength and actually start doing a study where we get MRIs post-op to look at their muscle volumes. So um, I hope I have more information for you in the next couple of years. But um, I, I think that all of the graphs are ap applicable to the skier. Again, I try to individualize everything. So, you know, what level of skiing are you doing? You know, just uh, groomed runs or backcountry or moguls or things like that. And uh, we, I just try to make an individualized decision and kind of stomp out all of that dogma. Thank you. You know, one question, one of the most important question, what more, this is just your personal opinion, what more we could do to be a better partner, you know, that people choose my tech and our products rather than people, it's all about people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, like I said, I kind of joke because I, I said how everything's the same, just different colors. It's about the people. So um, having, you know, knowledge of the procedures, but then applying that knowledge specifically to the techniques that your surgeons employ, that's 
what, in addition to just the friendliness set apart, you know, my reps uh, and, and going back to when I first made the transition, I felt like my, my tech rep knew more about Arthrex than the Arthrex prep. Like he could literally supplement their products if needed to, or, you know, tell me what the differences were and why, and even important, tell me what the limitations were of the MyTech one so that I was aware of it. Whereas, you know, the quote salesman is just going to try to blabber about how good their stuff is, but never look themselves in the mirror. So a good fundamental knowledge of why you're using it, what its strengths are, what its limitations are. And then as it pertains to the techniques that, that your surgeon is using, that's what will set you apart in my mind and just be nice. <laughs> yeah. Justin, Erna, thank you very, very much of your sharing your expertise, having a you know, very open dialogue on these topics. Thanks for everyone to join, to be active, and hopefully you have learned today something, even something that you didn't know yesterday. Great, thank you all and awesome meeting you.